It is now time for member statements. The member from Thornhill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. On behalf of myself and the entire PC caucus, I am honoured to extend my warmest greetings to all those who participated in last week's 34th Annual Holocaust Education Week in Toronto and all over the world. This was presented by Sarah and Chaim Neuberger, Holocaust Education Centre of UJA Federation of Greater Toronto. I'm proud to be able to say that this year Canada has assumed the position as the chair of the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. Holocaust Education Week offers extensive programming designed to engage Ontarians from all different types of heritage as the opportunity to delve into one of the darkest moments in human history and emerge with universal lessons of hope, tolerance and human rights. I myself attended a couple of fantastic events, one at the Royal Ontario Museum to mark the launch of Holocaust Education Week and another lecture at Shar Shalom Synagogue. Holocaust Education Week offers a powerful schedule of activities including films, discussions and exhibits that encourage remembrance and denounce intolerance. I want to take this opportunity to commend the dedication of the survivors, volunteers, staff and supporters from UJA Federation of the Greater Toronto Area and the Sarah and Chaim Neuberger Holocaust Education Centre for their efforts to make this and every year Holocaust Education Week such a success. Thank you for all the work that you do. Thank you. Member Stennis, the member from Parkdale High Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's my absolute honour to stand today and to recognize a woman who truly is a force of nature in Parkdale High Park and throughout the educational system, and that's Irene Atkinson, our trustee who is retiring after 40 years as a trustee, the longest serving trustee in the Toronto District School Board ever. And not only that, the only trustee who ever who has served on the Toronto Board of Education and on the TDSB as well. She's known as the mother of Sororan. She actually saved Sororan Park in our community uh, as a place for families rather than a place for garbage trucks to park. Uh, she's, she worked tirelessly and got extra funds for Parkdale uh, Public, Queen Victoria Public, Swansea Public, uh, Keele Public. I could go on and on over the 40 years. Uh, and she, a woman, a true woman, of conscience, used to be a red Tory, left the Conservative Party uh, after she saw what Mike Harris did to education in this province, crossed the floor to us. We were the happy beneficiaries of that and continue to serve the same folk. Uh, here's to Irene Atkinson after 40 years. We hope she has a wonderful retirement. Of course, a woman like that, Mr. Speaker, never really retires. She's actually going on to work on the review board and others, other boards in the community. But we're going to miss her, and I can tell you, uh, generation or two of education ministers are not going to miss her because she kept on their heels. Uh, here's to Irene and all the women like her. Thank you. Thank you. Member Stavis, the member from Mississauga Streetsville. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, last week, Ontarians all across our province paused for a minute of silence on November the 11th to commemorate the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month when the guns of World War I fell silent with the signing of the armistice between the Allied Nations and the Central Powers. The beginning of the end of war, wrote American veteran and author Herman Wauk, lies in remembrance. Our Royal Canadian Legion Branch 139 Streetsville marched with veterans, elected officials, fire, police and emergency response, as well as our very active Army, Navy and Air Cadet Corps. Queen Street in 2014 was lined with more people than anyone can ever recall attending a Remembrance Day ceremony. This year's ceremony was the first Remembrance Day at the redeveloped Streetsville Square with its rebuilt cenotaph and the last Remembrance Day for Hazel McCallion to preside as Mississauga's mayor. An estimated 3,500 people lined the streets and jammed the square to pay tribute to Canada's fallen soldiers and to remember not merely those who served in Canada's wars and peacekeeping, but also those who returned to build the great nation, the province, and the communities that we have and enjoy today. Thank you, Speaker. Mr. Speaker, recently we celebrated the first annual Carbon Monoxide Awareness Week part of the Hawkins Yinek Act, which passed last year. And I want to commend Ontario Fire Departments for their support and their efforts to raise awareness. For example, the Perth East and West Perth Fire Departments made the wake-up call 
a CO safety video that educates people on the dangers of carbon monoxide. In Peterborough, the fire department worked with First Alert and the Peterborough Peach to create an information display. In Barrie, the fire and emergency services knocked on doors and distributed printed materials describing the new CO laws in Ontario and held a talk with John Jinnak, founder of the Hawkins Jinnak Foundation for CO Education. I also want to recognize the Insurance Bureau of Canada, who have donated over 2,000 carbon monoxide detectors. In recognition of CO Awareness Week, they made donations in London, Ottawa, Cornwall, and several Oxford fire departments. They also donated to Habitat for Humanity in Leeds and the Thousand Islands. These carbon monoxide detectors will play an important role in protecting Ontarians. You can't see, smell, or taste carbon monoxide, so the only way to know your family is safe is to have a detector in your home. I want to thank everyone that helped promote Carbon Monoxide Awareness Week, including the members of all three parties. These efforts are making Ontario families safer and are a tribute to the Hawkins family, and I want to thank each and every one of you. Thank you. Member Stavis, the member from Welland. Oh, thank you, Speaker. Last uh, Thursday, November the 6th, I had the opportunity to actually attend a uh, event in my community at, at the Welland Community Centre to protect our local hospital services in our communities. You know, we hear about this issue day in and day out from small and rural communities across this province. It was attended by many, many people uh, in my riding, and they all had the same concerns. Closing hospital beds, uh, cutting CCAC services in our communities, wait lists for mental health services, uh, wait lists for long-term care beds, uh, giving our long-term care beds to the uh, private sector instead of to the uh, non-profit sector, uh, and those dollars should actually be going to the, to the care of individuals in our community. Now, um, this coming Friday, and I would encourage all MPPs to attend this event, there's actually going to be a rally here at Queen's Park. Um, it is uh, sponsored by the Ontario Health Coalition and the Niagara Health Coalition. And it's here at 12 p.m. On, on Friday. There are buses coming in from across the province because everyone is concerned about the erosion of health care services uh, in their communities. And so, I, you know, in my own community, uh, many hospitals have closed. Another one is slated for closure. And so, please uh, attend this rally and show your support to keep our hospitals open. Thank you. Member Stevens, the member from Davenport. Yes, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I am rising today to recognize a tremendous milestone in Davenport. On Saturday, November 8th, Regal Road Public School celebrated its centennial anniversary. This means that since 1914, Regal Road has been at the forefront of guiding and educating Davenport's young people. Regal Road Public School was constructed for the Dovercourt community just as the area was annexed to the City of Toronto. It is a magnificent building designed in the Beaux Arts style by architect Franklin E. Belfry, who also designed many other schools in Toronto, including Oakwood Collegiate, also in my riding. And in 2007, the City of Toronto declared the school as a heritage building. Regal Road is a wonderful school located at the northeast corner of Davenport Road and Dufferin Street. And actually, my colleague from North Humberland, Quinty West, attended Regal Road when he first moved to Toronto in the 1960s. Oh, yeah. That's right. The school enrolls approximately 520 students from JK to grade 6 and offers a dual track system with both English and French immersion curriculum. Reflective of my riding of Davenport, students at Regal Road are from a diversity of cultural backgrounds. Mr. Speaker, I had the pleasure to meet a tour group from Regal Road at the Legislature in September, and I look forward to meeting more students from this exciting school going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Today, the government releases its fall economic statement. The Ontario Chamber of Commerce has said Ontarians should be very concerned about the direction in which this province is heading. The recent interim report by Ed Clark is proof the Liberals will not make tough decisions to reduce spending to balance the books. We can expect today's economic statement to continue the Liberals' unrealistic and unaffordable path that puts frontline services in jeopardy while hurting families in every part of this province, including those having the hardest time. Mr. Speaker, this government is spending beyond its means. The Bank of Canada and Conference Board of Canada have also provided evidence that the government's path Order. is unsustainable. 
sustainable. Under the Liberals, our debt has doubled, and our annual debt interest payment now approaches $11 billion. That's taxpayers' money that should be invested in frontline health care, first-rate education, reliable roads and transit. All Ontarians are paying the price for debt interest costs that take money out of priority services like health care and education. This Liberal government is always trying to blame someone else for not getting their own house in order. They've doubled the debt in just 11 years, Mr. Speaker. They continually blame lower than expected revenues and the federal government. Mr. Speaker, this Liberal government must take responsibility for their bad policy decisions. I hope they'll do that today. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member statements. The member from Etobicoke Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, last week I had the privilege of traveling to Ukraine to support a medical humanitarian mission where Canadian doctors perform surgery on patients, victims of the war in eastern Ukraine, people who were fighting for their freedom and their democracy. I also had the opportunity to visit the National Holodomor Memorial, and I stand here today to commemorate the Holodomor. Holodomor Commemoration Week, which is this week, is the 81st anniversary, pays tribute to the 81st anniversary of the Holodomor, when Joseph Stalin closed Ukraine's borders, confiscated grain to destroy a Ukrainian population that resisted his rule, who sought the freedom and democracy that the people in Ukraine are fighting for today. During that time, Mr. Speaker, 17 people per minute, 1,000 per hour, and 25,000 per day were dying from famine. And the world, Mr. Speaker, was silent. Millions died as a result. My grandmother was one of those people who survived the famine, and she, once, and she lost three of her brothers to the Soviet regime. She once told me that she hopes that the victims of the Holodomor will not only be remembered, but honored. Honoring means not just remembering them and commemorating them, but also learning from their mistakes, learning from mistakes that we made and making sure that we take the steps to make sure it never happens again. And one of the things that needs to be done is make sure that our young people here in Ontario learn about the Holodomor. And that is why I'm so pleased to be here today, to stand here with the leaders of the Ukrainian community who have worked towards that for so many years, with you, Mr. Speaker, and other members of the legislature who co-sponsored a bill to commemorate the Holodomor, and with our Premier and with our Education Minister who have spoken in the past about the importance of teaching the Holodomor and have ensured that the Holodomor will be part of our curriculum so that every Ontarian learns about the Holodomor. Today, I'd like to take this opportunity, Mr. Speaker, to not only reflect commemorate the victims of the Holodomor, but ask us to recommit ourselves to make sure that we learn from the mistakes of the past to make sure tragedies like this and those that are happening in Ukraine never happen again. Let us do what my grandmother would have asked. Let us not only remember them, the victims, let us not only commemorate the victims, let us honour them, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Member statements. The member from Ottawa, Orleans. Mr. President, je suis fier. Mr. Speaker, I'm proud to raise today to support the months uh, Crohn's disease and colitis. Crohn's disease and colitis are the most current uh, diseases that attack the intestine. And at the present time, there is no treatment that is known, and we don't really know what causes that kind of disease. Interiors should be really preoccupied by colitis and Crohn's disease. 95,000 people in Ontario have one of these diseases, and in my family, is one of the families that are affected by this disease. Two of my cousins have this disease, so I know uh, what challenges those people have to, uh, to bear. For 40 years, Crohn's disease and colitis uh, associations, they try to find a cure, and they also want to improve uh, lives of children and adults that are affected by this disease. Once again, Andrew Old and his mother, Marta, who are here today, volunteers and the staff de Crown Colite Canada pour leurs efforts et leur dévouement. Ils travaillent fort pour la faciliter le quotidien des personnes vivant avec cette maladie. And they tr try to uh, work and to fight this disease. So thank you very much. I thank all members for their statements.